my palette guitar. <laughs> That's what we're here to talk about. That's what I'm here to talk about. So, uh, are there many guitar players or just Guns N' Roses fans? Oh, guitar players, all right. I, I was hoping there would be guitar players here. So, I don't know uh, what you guys know about me and my history, but I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri and played in bands as a kid. Ended up signing a record deal when I was about 20. And with, with my band from high school. And we signed with Atlantic Records and then went on tour with a band called The Psychedelic Furs. And then I ended up joining that band. And then ended up starting another band with a singer called Love Spit Love. And then lived in New York for, I guess, about 17 years. Uh, long enough to know better. <laughs> um, but then moved, uh, I still actually own my apartment in New York and uh, just now selling it, but uh, finally giving up on the dream of someday moving back to the city, but uh, having kids changes things, you know? Um, so anyways, I, when I was in New York, besides playing with the Psychedelic Furs, I played with a lot of other artists, mainly doing session work and composing for TV and film and commercials and video games and stuff like that. Had a studio in time, just south of Times Square um, for years. And then joined Guns N' Roses and eventually moved to LA. Uh, and then moved to St. Louis, back to St. Louis after that. So I didn't want my kids to grow up in Los Angeles. Anyways, so I live in St. Louis now, and I've been with Guns N' Roses for 17 years, I think. Yeah, 17 years. Coming up on 18 years. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, to stick with that band for that long. <laughs> We've been through quite a bit. But the last few years have been uh, really great, since uh, Slash and Duff have come back in the band, and... It's been, uh, everybody's doing great, and we, this band has never sounded better. And, uh, well, I'm biased, but since I've been in the band, this, this is the best <laughs> it's ever sounded. Anyways, so I'm doing this thing today, talking about this signature guitar that I designed with this company called Paoletti. Now, Paoletti contacted me a while ago and asked if they could build me a guitar. I really like guitars. So I said, sure you can build me a guitar. Yeah. And I looked, and, and uh, you know, people, people contacted me, contact me regularly and want to, hey, can you check out my guitars? Sure. So I told them what I, I looked up what they were doing, because I'd never heard of them. And it turns out they're made out of, all their guitars are made out of 150 year old wine barrels. Chestnut wood. Now, I've never played a chestnut guitar. Just, uh, it's a very unusual wood for a guitar. You drank wine. Huh? I've drank wine, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, how bad could it be? No, no, I thought, I actually thought, well, this just sounds really gimmicky to me. But uh, they, sent, and they ended up building me one that I wanted. They sent it to me and I was really blown away. So then we spent about a year refining it, going back and forth, like, no, I want to change this, I want to change that, I want to change the capacitors. Um, what we ended up with, I'm very proud of. So first of all, chestnut, it turns out, is an exceptional tone wood at least when it's 150 years old and soaked in wine for that amount of time. It makes it very porous and very uh, vibrant and alive sounding. And I was really impressed with that and uh, therefore wanted to enter into this partnership with them. 
what what I wanted to do is I love their this is like a sort of a Les Paul Jr. body style, which I'm partial to. Um, but I wanted a telly pickup in it. Uh, and not only that, I wanted to do a left-handed telly bridge. So it reverses the angle. Now, the reason I like to do that, I've done that on strats and other tellies for years. Jimi Hendrix had it right. You know, he, he happened to it, I think, by chance being left-handed and there not being many left-handed guitars he just flipped over his strat but when he did that he reversed the angle of the pickup so that for those guitar players that are here when you're low on the neck you generally have your bridge pickup on right because otherwise it's real too muddy right As you get up higher on the neck, you switch to your neck pickup. Because that's it's warmer sounding. So Leo Fender, when he started this whole thing of the electric guitar of the uh, solid body guitar, he had to angle the opposite way. Now, he angled the pickup because he took the pickup out of a lap steel, okay? And it was too big, so he angled it. Figured, well, we can just turn it. But he turned, in my opinion, he turned it the wrong way. You know, when, like what I just showed you, you're using your bridge pickup when you're lower, and as you get higher, you always want to go to the neck pickup. So that's what this mimics, essentially, by reversing the angle. Jimmy had it right. Um, also, another nod to Jimi Hendrix is that when he flipped the guitar over, the headstock was backwards, which puts more tension on the low strings, which gives you more of a piano type of low end, which, uh, you know, if you're familiar with Hendrix's work, he always had this amazing low-end sound to his guitar that always blew me away. tension gives you more low, it gives you a more piano-like resonance because it's putting more tension on that string. The top strings have less tension, therefore are easier to bend. So it's just physics. Again, Leo had, had it the other way for some reason. And it sort of back, seemed backwards to me. Anyways, not to knock Leo genius, but uh, Hendrix was more of a genius, I guess. So, <laughs> so anyways, the, the pickup itself was another thing. I, I uh, if you know much about me, I spent a lot of time experimenting with pickups and uh, going through every guitar, every piece of wood is different. So it's sort of, you, you know, it's finding the right combination is is tough. Fortunately, I'm in a position to where I can try out lots of different pickups and uh, different pieces of wood and stuff like that. So I, I get to experiment a lot. And this pickup with this wood works really well. It's actually a pickup that Lindy Fralin wound for me was the original one. Um, and it's sort of a copy of my original I have a 51 no caster which is uh, the one of the first years of solid body telecasters the, when Leo started first it was the broadcaster then he took the name he got sued for broadcaster so he had to take the name off so then it was just Fender and that's called the no caster so I have a 51 no caster and it's my favorite pickup ever, like for tellies. You know, that's it's just magical. So we 
basically have recreated that pickup and it works really well with this wood. And then the P90 we found worked best in the neck, which is an unusual combination for, uh, for those that know, uh, combining a, a P90 and a, and a Tele pickup. But uh, that's, that's what we've ended up with. The magic of this guitar though is really what we've done with the electronics the capacitors and resistors that we put in line here allow you to go from a blazing type of lead sound like I started off with dropping your volume down and you've got sparkly and pretty sounding. A lot of newer guitars you'll notice it, it's sort of a lost art, the, the volume knob, I think. You know, it's something that Slash and I both really are on our volumes all the time. Because there's so many different tones. It, it, with older guitars you'll find, if you pick up a 50s Junior, you'll find there's so many tones within a volume knob, within your volume knob. Um, and the newer, newer guitars seem to miss that because the wiring is different. This really focuses heavily on that. So this guitar is all about that. So you can play with a single channel amp and that's what I do with GNR. I have a, I have a single channel, two single channel amps that I run made by this guy, Supro, um, and the, which are also made here in Long Island. Uh, it, so that's, that's the amp that I use live. And they're single channel. And I just work the volume up. And uh, slash those as well. And that's, we spend a lot of time. You watch videos, we're constantly, both of us are constantly. And I went, I was hanging out with uh, Bonamassa last night. Joe Bonamassa played in the city. And I got to go hang out with him. And he as well, you know, it's just always volume up. But he plays all old guitars. Anyways, that's, there's, there's so much there and a lot of kids today don't, they sort of miss out on that, I think. But uh, that's what this is all about, this guitar. So if you can hang with that single channel in, <laughs> this might be something you might want to check out. Um, it's sort of like, a, I love the articulation of Tellys. Um, and the sound of a P90 in the neck, but it, there's a definition and clarity that you get with tele pickups that I just really dig. And uh, that's why I think it's a really special guitar. Anyways, uh, does anybody have questions? I do. So it sounds really good, it sounds great. So Thank it you. It sounds like a lot of what you do is fine, though, with anything you have. Uh -huh. so, so basically with this, you don't need a lot of effect, uh, effect pedals or Mm -mm. All I've got going on right now is uh, I've got an H9 Harmony, uh, the uh, Eventide, with just a little bit of slapback or a little bit of delay. In. You know, that's it. Um, but yeah, there's no effects. I mean, I, I was watching Bonamassa last night, and he's the same deal, and he was doing a lot of like little, you know, that whole violin thing, this volume swell, you know, no effects. But, uh, yeah, God, he was a master of that. I never saw Roy play, yeah. No, I saw Danny Gatton, but I never saw. Oh, yeah, Danny. Yeah. 
Yeah, another, both masters of the telecaster. Yeah, and so what else were you gonna say? No, that was it. That was it, okay. Just, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's got great sound. Cool, thanks. Is any of that great sound due to the EVA jam? <laughs> uh, it's actually, you know, I was just playing one. This is actually not an EVH. It's a, it's that little con amp. It's an all tube head, but it fits in my gig bag. So uh, when I get on a plane and I show up at the music <laughs> store, I, I know what I'm gonna get. But the EVH amps, I was just playing some in the back, and they're phenomenal. They sound really great. Like the little lunchbox one sounds great. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, man, I could have just. Could have just brought that, but you know, you sort of want to be comfortable with what you. So yeah, that's made by Con Audio, but it's all two, and it's actually a two-channel. But I just use the single. I mean, I just use the dirty channel and just because then I roll my volume down. Yeah, but they are they are cool amps. Yeah. Have you always been more of a single coil type player, or do you feel like that just fits better with Guns N' Roses because you know Slash is typically like a humbucker guitar, and that might sit better in the band? And That's a very good point. Um, yeah. So my job in Guns N' Roses is to compliment Slash, really. You know, because I mean he's got the hat. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important thing. The cool thing about tellies, and it doesn't really work with strats, um, but with tellies, it seems to complement his sound on certain songs. And, uh, and the combination of the P90 and the, it really works well. Uh, like on Sweet Child, I play this on, uh, that, you know, there's like used to love her. You know, there's certain sounds where it really works. Otherwise, uh, Gretsch's. You know, Gretsch works. I mean, Gretsch is just such a great, underrated rock sound. But it's it's such a big part of our rock and roll DNA, thanks to you know Malcolm and uh, Billy Duffy. And I mean, there's so many. It, Gretsch is a great rock guitar that's really underrated but it works great <coughs> I, I i play a lot of gretches so yeah that it really complements slash because it sits around his tone his tone is very sort of vocal sounding you know it's very throaty and yeah like it's beefy at times but it's really so i'll go with less game and try and fill around what he's doing right you know but yeah, that's a, a very good point and something that I always try and keep in mind. You know? And when I use humbuckers, I'll use a low output humbucker, again, with less gain, so it really sort of is separated from his tone. Because his tone's real saturated and real slashy. It differentiates your tone too from his. Yeah, right. Anybody else got questions? Yeah. Is that, is that your personal one? This is my personal one. The only other white one was here at Music Zoo. Yeah, that is that's the only other white one that's come to the U.S. so far. What? So let's lower the volume. Okay, see how the top end is going now. It's still 50s, 50s wiring. Much more mid rangey. Um, not as uh, not as articulate as is the tally pickup, but um, yeah, it's. A, I don't know what kind of. I don't know what kind of humbuckers they used. Do you know? Yeah, they probably wind them themselves. They're, they're doing like everything in-house now, which is pretty cool for a guitar company. Oh, this switch. That's one of the older necks, huh? Check it out, it's the, the flame on the back of the neck.
more teeth on it, you know? What's that? How far would I have to travel to find a lefty? Oh, you know, that's the cool thing about Paoletti is they make everything custom. So, yeah, I mean, it might take you a little bit, but they could uh, build you one. Yeah. But then you'd have to use a right-handed bridge and a right-handed neck. It seems like it would be easier to... Yeah. yeah. Are the neck and the body the same wood? No. No. This is a maple nut. And it's roasted maple. Say it didn't look like a traditional maple. Yeah, it's roasted. And this is an Italian maple. Do the guitars come from Italy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're made in Italy. Where are the woods from? But yeah, the factory's in England, in Italy. Is that like a 57 mil strat neck? When they roast them, it's to make it feel more like a 50s neck, right? But yeah, so they bake the wood to basically remove the humidity from the moisture from it, so it dries it out. Uh, I saw you years ago in New York, Frank, and uh -huh. you were using a guild. And I swear to God, you had an amp this big. Was it a Gretsch amp with like one or two knobs on it? And it I sounds like me. Show, and I was just like wondering what it was because that whole night you had twenty talents coming out of that one little. Accessory. You showed up in a gig bag and an amp like that. Yeah, yeah. God, that's what's great about New York. <laughs> you have to carry shit. <laughs> yeah, you have to fit it in the back of the cab. I swear, an 8-inch speaker looked like it was from the 50s or 60s. Uh, yeah, very possibly. Are you a fan of really small I am. I'm totally a fan of small amps. I mean, that's, you know, live, what I use, I use a little Supro um, Black Magic. Just the Black Magic? Mm-hmm. And also, a, they did a big head for me as well. Oh, the new one Dave made that new, the, the channel switching head? Or no, 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 it's a single channel. Actually, Rich right there, he did it. <laughs> Not to point fingers. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, we worked together on this amp. You seem to have a lot of what I call string definition. Like I can hear every note in the chord. That's, oh, yeah, that's, that's the goal for me. You know, especially, again, especially when I'm working with Slash, you know, offset his sound. But uh, yeah, I love little amps. Man, Supro makes a little 1-8 amp, a single, it's, it's like a single 8-inch, right? Yes. I think Perry uses for a part of Yes, that. exactly. Like it, it, it sounds phenomenal. And like adding that to a 412 cab, just, you know, when you can blend the two in the studio, it's phenomenal, but I use little amps all the time, and I have a lot of old little amps. Yeah, like little um, Watkins and uh, uh, Valco, and which was essentially, I mean, Supro, same. You know, back in the day. Yeah, I, you know, I started with Marshall, and I started collecting a lot of little. Yeah, <laughs> you know, little amps is sound huge in the studio. Well, those records that we listened grew up with. That's right, that's right. Little amps always sound big in the studio. They do. Anybody else? Yeah? I know you did a lot of uh, finger picking. that you prefer to go to that? Uh, so when I was a kid, I studied classical guitar, um, which sort of got my right hand together. And then through guys like Danny Gatton and uh, um, Rudd Cannon and um, all, you know all the guys that were all the country players like I love I'm not a big country music fan but I love country guitar and so 
through that and trying to figure out what they were doing sort of ended up with this weird hybrid rock country thing. And then I'll do a lot of like intervallic stuff. But yeah, that's I, I switch back and forth a lot. And there's something really expressive about playing with your fingers, you know, that you can't do with a pick, you know. You pull, you know, to snap a string is different than a pick, you know. It's just more expressive. And then also all the yeah, that's, I, yeah, I like that stuff. Yeah, but good eye. Actually, I, Dave told me you were uh, studying up on your finger picking lately. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, man, Jeff Beck, greatest living guitar player. Yeah. It's all fingers. He dropped his pick 30 years ago and never picked it up. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's how it started. Apparently, he dropped his dropped his pick on stage, and was like, "Oh, this is sort of cool." <laughs> just, yeah. Bobby Creed was that way too, right? Yeah. 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 He was. I mean, uh, he came from a classical school as well. Yeah. We. You, you're a Krieger fan. I mean, I love old music. I can listen. I love old music too. Classical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love everything. Yeah, I was never really a big Bobby Krieger fan, but... Yeah, sure. There's a lot of kind of hybrid sort of sometimes the thing Yeah, yeah. Right, also. Well, yeah. But, I mean, you know, Slash also plays a lot with his fingers. A lot more than people realize, I think. But, it, it, because there's... You can get so much more out of one sound, you know, on your amp, and you drop the volume on your guitar, and then it's you're you're left with a lot of expressiveness with your fingers. You can go from you can barely touch the string, you know, where you can't do that with a pick as as effectively. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Yes. When you when you first started playing with guns, in order to get like the sound and the tone that Izzy had on the early material, uh -huh. did you feel the need to try to you know match his gear and get the same stuff that he was playing with, or did you feel like you could work with the gear that you already had and just kind of adjust your settings and all that to sort of get that same sound? And tone? Yeah, it's sort of like to me, Izzy is not a gear guy, you know. Um, he comes from more of a, he's a meat and potatoes, straight ahead, you know, I don't care what it is, plug it in, you know, guitar to the amp type of player. And uh, so, and comes from a, a rootsier background. So it, I got what he was doing. He was doing the, he was going for, and it's funny, as I started to hang out with him and get to know him, um, through the years, like I, I, my initial impressions were correct. You know, he's coming from that Keith school, you know, and offsetting, that really offset what Slash was doing. So, you know, less gain and uh, more sparse playing, you know, but it really worked well. And I think a lot of that had to also do with Mike Plink you know, as far as appetite and how the two guitars were juxtaposed. But yeah, I I just I approached it not in matching the gear as much as match matching the philosophy, you know. And playing too. Just, you know, doing my own thing, but maintaining that direction. Anybody else? Yeah. Question, because you play so much, what gauge strings do you use? Because I play so much? Yeah, because I know for myself, I had to change over the years because I used to play much heavier strings and my hands don't hold up anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. 
It's funny. Um, first of all, the, the strings that I use are uh, NYXLs, which are made here in Farmingdale uh, by Diodario. And just to talk about strings for a second, I, I was with, Diodario was actually my first endorsement as a, as a kid. Like they were the first company that sponsored me, that gave me gear, gave me strings. Um, when I was like 20 years old. And I was with them for years and then ended up switching to some other string manufacturers for various reasons and was with Rotosound for a long time. And uh, they were really supportive of me and did full page ads and stuff like that. And then I played a set of NYXLs and I was like, God damn it, I gotta switch back. They're just, they're the best strings I've ever played. They're just the best sounding strings. But, okay, I still use 10 to 52. And I, now we tune down a half step. And the scale length is less pull or strut? Uh, I mean, this is, this is a standard fender, so it's 25 and a half. So it's a bit more tension than the Gibson's. But even on, the, even on my Gibson scale, I still use the 10 to 52. Um, in the studio, sometimes I'll use like 9 to 46. I, I, I still, that's even standard pitch, I still use 10 to 52. I was, you know, it should not work. It, it, like his stuff, if I play his guitar, it, it's, I can't play his guitars. Have you ever picked up one of his guitars? The bowling guitars? They're like two pounds. He hollows, bowling actually hollows out the neck for him. That's crazy. Like that, there should be no tone in those guitars, but he makes it work. You know, with his combination, the way he, he barely touches the string. You know, he, yeah. That's what he swung around his neck, so it's like. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But he makes it work. But also, I gotta say, my favorite ZZ Top stuff is the stuff when he was playing through a real guitar and you know yeah man Les Paul and a deluxe and you know like Deguelo and like Trace Ombres like all that stuff man that his tone is impeccable it's absolutely perfect and he's playing a burst you know anyways yeah so I, I where do you where do you have fatigue um is it, no, I, is it your left or your right? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty self-aware uh, uh, as far as, it, it tends to move around because I move myself around so that it doesn't become chronic in any one spot. Right, okay. So, and, and I'm also playing four and five six, and six string bass and some other stuff. So I'm doing too yeah. much. The problem is I'm playing too much. And that, that, how I'm playing is bad, but I need a break. Right, right. So that, that and I, 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 the, you just don't play for pain. You know, the bottom line is if, if it hurts, you, you stop. Mm -hmm. And and you know. It will if I'm you're smart. If you're smart, you do. Yeah. But but honestly, that's this is something that so many of my friends deal with daily. And uh, Slash and I both have issues with our arms mm -hmm. because of because all we do is sit around and noodle. I mean. He plays constantly. Like you know, we're, we're always backstage for hours before a show, and both of us are just like constantly playing. Um, but we have issues with tendons, so I carry on the road with me a thing called a Theragun, which is uh, percussion therapy, and it works really well. I've found that it works really well because. And I'll notice, like halfway through a tour, my arm uh, and slash as well, our arms really start to give us trouble. That really helps. So you might want to look into that. But yeah, lighter strings. I don't know. I mean, I I, I can't personally. Mm -hmm. Like going from that Van Halen guitar back there and then picking up my guitar is like, oh okay. You know, it's just so. I'm just just what I'm used to. So if you can get used to lighter strings, I mean. Billy Gibbons didn't always play sevens, so. One more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how much do you sing at Guns N' Roses? I don't sing at all right now in Guns N' Roses. 
No, because uh, Melissa and Dizzy and Duff do all the... Yeah, so I just stop. What about your other band? Uh, not a lot. I'm not a great singer, I'm but... I'm saying it's a hard thing, like, some of my friends used to get into the tours just because they weren't the best guitar players, but you can sing harmony vocals, was like a big thing. Yeah, you know, um, when, um, uh, in Def Leppard, uh, Joe Elliott asked me one time to sub for Vivian because he had cancer, yeah. and he said, you know, 90% of that gig is singing. That's what he said when he joined the band. Yeah. He, and he could play the parts. He said the singing was... Like, I'm Vivian could play anything. He's such a great guitar player. But his voice is phenomenal. He's a really great singer. So I was like, Joe, I can't do that. <laughs> I actually couldn't do it for other reasons, which was a good excuse, but... Yeah. I mean, you don't realize like, some of your favorite bands, it's all the vocals. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, it definitely helps to be a good singer. I'm just not that great. But I do sing, I mean, you do it on necessity, I guess. That, or at least for me, it's always been on necessity. Anybody else? Yep? Does being a good guitarist, or in your case, great guitarist, translate to being a good teacher? No. <laughs> no. No, some of the greatest guitar players are terrible teachers. I mean, you know, but then, me? I don't know. I enjoy it. I, I really do enjoy it, and I find that it benefits myself when I when I do teach. But it's been it's been a while, you know. But um, like, you know who's great? Paul Gilbert. I think he's such a great teacher. He just the way he explains things is so great. But I still take lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Great teachers are not. No, that doesn't necessarily equate. Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. How did the, the build-up intro to Better come about? Why? Like that build-up you guys saw before the beginning of um, I can tell you. The build-up to Better started, and the reason we started doing that is because Axel had a remix that Brain did of that song. You know, Brain, the yeah. drummer. Um, he did a remix of that song, and it had that... Uh, like a similar type of thing like that and so we started that's where it came from we were like oh, okay what can we do we should start it out like that because we really like that part of that yeah. so that's how that came about yeah i like it it's fun that's i mean that's where great stuff seems to come from is when you try and do something to emulate something and it becomes your own you know as you it becomes its own thing Yep. Yeah. yeah. Any new Gene Art material in the works? Oh, um, maybe. So did you hear us a while ago, or are you just looking for something completely different? No, I'm just looking to implement knowledge. Uh, you know, just for me, it's more about looking for new approaches, and uh, that's what I look. That's why I go to teachers for. Yeah, I just want to get a different perspective, okay. you know? That's awesome. But I'm, I, I think we all do that, you know, as I mean, I'm sure you do as well. You're always looking for new inspiration and for uh, anything to inspire you to go down a different direction, you know, to... Uh, and, and then you end up with this vocabulary from all over the place, you know, that makes it your own. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. How is working with Axel? With Axel? Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Axel's Most awesome. Likely. He's been here for 17 years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I get along great with Axel, and uh, he's one of the funniest, smartest guys that I know. But I mean, you wouldn't. I mean, I know his reputation, is, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's he's a pleasure to work with, and and true genius. I mean, really, his. To me, like the magic of Axel is like he's got this ability of um, sort of pulling different ideas and putting things together in really ways that I would never think of, and it it works. It's really, really uh, in, inspiring to be around. Yeah, yeah, but he's great. Axel's awesome. He just gets a bad. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, when we're kids, you know, you do stupid stuff. 
<laughs> but no, man, he's been great. Yeah, yeah, he's, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced. I've worked with a lot of people, but yeah, when you stand next to that guy on stage, it's, it's intense. Slash too, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Slash is very inspiring to be around. Now, I'll tell you the true genius of Slash is, you know, I get, as a guitar player, I know that you, you tend to get caught into patterns. You get, there's ruts that you get into, you know, where you, there's safe zones, you know, that you, safety licks that you just sort of go back to all the time. I'm not saying he doesn't have that, but he will go up, I'll, I, every night I listen to him go up to do his solo, and it's different every night. And to me, that's genius, you know? That's why he's a legend, you know? Because he stretches, he takes chances every night. And you know, some nights he might not be that great, maybe it's not working, you know, whatever. But other nights it's like, you know, the hair on my arms is standing up as I'm sitting there listening to him play. It's, it's really cool. I'm very fortunate that I get to do that with him and see it every night. Huh? Anybody else or are we gonna sign stuff? All right, let's do it.